He photographed perilous polar expeditions for a pre-war Australia before going on to cover the horrors of the Western Front and the unforgiving desert of North Africa. But his obsession to get the perfect shot to tell the story he wanted to tell, even at the expense of the truth and reality, in a time centuries before the invention of Photoshop, put him at odds with his peers and colleagues. While he was an unreliable narrator, his film and photographs still form the basis of most people's understanding of the experiences at the time and the true horrors of war. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the life, career and legacy of Honorary Captain James Francis Frank Hurley, who served as official war photographer for both the First and Second World Wars, as well as the official photographer for the famous Mawson and Shackleton Antarctic Expeditions. James Francis Hurley, better known historically as Frank Hurley, was born on the 15th of October 1885 in the Sydney district of Glebe. He was the second son to Edward Harrison Hurley, a Lancashire-born typesetter and trade union official, and his wife Margaret Agnes, who came from a family of Vintners from Alsace-Lorraine. While his early life and schooling was in Glebe, when Hurley turned 13 he ran away from home to the town of Lithgow, located to the west of the Great Dividing Range that runs along Australia's eastern coastline, to start work at the Lithgow Steel Mill as a fitter's apprentice. Hurley would return to the family home two years later to study at night at the Glebe Technical School and attend science lectures at the University of Sydney while working as an apprentice electrical fitter and instrument maker in the lighting branch of the New South Wales Telegraphic Department. While his studies would be in engineering, he discovered that he had an interest and a knack for photography around this same time and would go on to sacrifice a large portion of his wages on a Kodak box brownie camera that he paid off at one shilling per week. With this camera and the support of his father, who was at the time the secretary of the Printing Trades Federation, he would join Harry Cave in 1905 as a photographer's apprentice in a busy postcard business, and quickly gained a reputation for not only exceptional work, but the extravagant risks he would undertake in order to achieve the photos he took, including by accounts standing in the path of oncoming steam trains or on rocky outcroppings to capture stunning vistas from crushing waves. He quickly became a self-taught expert in photography and would give talks about the subject, and in particular the advances of photographic chemistry and manipulation, publishing papers in local journals and lecturing at camera clubs. He particularly liked working in the darkroom, where he developed considerable skill at combining parts of different negatives to form one composite image. His skill in this area haunts his reputation to this day because it raises doubts about the credibility of some of his most famous images. Despite these successes, the postcard business was largely unprofitable, and when his father passed away in 1907, the financial support that he had been providing vanished, and shortly later, Harry Cave would retire from the business, leaving the debts largely unpaid, with some sources stating that Hurley personally owed over £1,000, which equates to approximately $158,244.31 in today's money. By all accounts, Hurley was bankrupt. Enter Douglas Mawson. In January 1911, Sir Douglas Mawson had just announced his Australasian Antarctic expedition, and Hurley, by this time, was close to broke. But he had heard that his friend and fellow photographer, Henry Mallard, who had been working for Harrington's Limited, a photography shop in Sydney, had initially declined Mawson's offer to become the expedition's photographer. In his place, Mallard suggested that Mawson take Hurley instead. So Mallard was also instrumental in convincing Harrington's to forgive most of Hurley's debts. Years after this expedition, Hurley would go on to invent a colourful story about how he got Mawson to take him. He wrote that he bribed the station master in Sydney to allow him into Mawson's first class cabin on a train to Adelaide, and he claimed that he persuaded Mawson during the two hour trip between Sydney's central station and Mossvale. In fact, Sir Douglas Mawson proceeded with the typical caution of his career in the appointment of Hurley. One reason was that uh, Hurley's mother, Marguerite, had written to Mawson pleading to him not to take her son to Antarctica stating that her boy had lung trouble and might not be able to survive the journey. Now this concerned Mawson because at the time, tuberculosis was a major health issue in the world. Mawson insisted that Hurley prove his medical fitness through thorough testing. He also sent him for training with the newsreel company Gamon because Hurley had no experience in shooting moving images, which would have been a major component of his role in the expedition. He would not even confirm his appointment until Gamon's best experts vouched for Hurley's new skill set. Frank Hurley wouldn't know about his mother's letter when he officially joined Mawson's expedition. Leaving Hobart on the 2nd of December 1911 aboard the SY Aurora, he would actually cross paths with 
Edward Frederick Robert Page. At 26, Hurley was about to begin a journey that would define not only his reputation, but the rest of his life. The account Hurley gave on how he joined Morse's expedition says a lot about the man. It contained his sense of adventure, his brashness, and a sign of iron will, but also showed his predilection for rampant exaggeration, not to mention his knack of blatant untruths. That categorized much of his own version of events. With any aspect of Hurley's adventurous life, truth and legend are hard to separate, and it's fair to say he was keener with the legend than the story. Even without the embellishment, Hurley worked enthusiastically under those arduous conditions, taking both still photographs and movie film as part of Edward Bage's Southern Party to visit the South Magnetic Pole region, and his high spirits made him a popular and valued member of the team, which seemed invaluable considering how treacherous the conditions were. Hurley's famous motion picture images of the expedition as being driven backwards by the strength of the catabaric winds at Cape Denison captured the day-to-day -day hardships and heroism of life in the Antarctic. He used a hand-cranked movie camera, the Debris Parvo L 35mm, to document expedition activities. He also took part in a record-breaking sledging journey to the South Magnetic Pole, averaging 66 kilometers per day, and filmed key events along the way. When the Aurora returned to collect them at base camp after the expedition, all bar one team had returned, the one led by expedition leader Sir Douglas Mawson, who had been tasked with reaching Oatsland, roughly 560 kilometers from their base camp. By the 8th of February, as the Aurora and the other teams waited, Mawson's team was now four weeks overdue, and John Davis, officer in charge of the Aurora, was forced to decide if the ship would stay and risk being frozen in, leave a team to conduct a search, or abandon Mawson and his team to their fate. The decision was made to leave a team to conduct a search, and the Aurora would return when conditions improved. Unlike Beige, who remained to wait for Mawson, Hurley, along with his camera equipment and film, boarded the Aurora and returned to Australia. Back in Sydney, he rapidly assembled his movie footage and successfully presented it to the public in August as Home of the Blizzard, which contained some of the earliest moving footage of Antarctica and turned Hurley into an instant celebrity. Mawson and Bage's rescue would have to wait another year, as they desperately needed Hurley's films to contribute to the rescue funds to be able to send the Aurora back. Instead, Hurley took up a job photographing cultural life in Java, now modern-day Indonesia, for the Dutch Steam Packet Company. The screenings in Australia of the Mawson film took place without him, and the meager returns contributed little to the rescue fund. When Mawson found out about Hurley's trip to Java, he resented that for a long time afterwards. Hurley, for his part, thought that he'd been denied a decent share of the returns from his efforts with Mawson. Regardless, Hurley joined another expedition to Antarctica to re retrieve the stranded Mawson Beige and the expedition. When he returned to the Australia, this time, Beige would join the Australian Imperial Force at the outbreak of the First World War. Hurley, however, due to his fame, took a different route, as he was commissioned by Francis Bertels to film a 6,000-mile expedition by car into the outback of Australia and produced a film of their various encounters along the way. In October of 1914, he received a telegram from Irish-born Sir Ernest Shackleton to accompany him on his Imperial Transantarctic Expedition aboard the Endurance. Despite the risk, Early left at the chance, particularly when he secured a lucrative deal to take 25% share of the expedition's film rights. Hurley and Shackleton first met in Buenos Aires in October of 1914, and soon found they treated triumph and disaster in the same unruffled manner. Shackleton was an explorer of the type who carried the Union Jack over uncharted seas and planted it in the heart of unknown lands for sheer adventure's sake, Hurley wrote. Shackleton quickly recruited Hurley to join the select band of six men tasked with the expedition's most ambitious and dangerous 1,800-mile or 2,800-kilometer coast-to-coast trek across the largely unknown Antarctic continent. However, the trek never materialized because the endurance was crushed in the ice in a treacherous Weddell Sea in 1915, leaving 28 men marooned on a floating ice sheet cut off from the rest of the civilized world. Hurley took the famous shots of Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, breaking apart in the grip of the polar ice, and would be the last person to see Endurance intact until the 5th of March 2022, when an expedition titled Endurance 22 would find the hull under the ice. At the time, Hurley was experimenting with night photography and captured stunning images of the Endurance trapped in the ice, illuminated only by hand lanterns and flares held by the crew. The act would actually momentarily blind Hurley. It is thought that Hurley travelled to the ice with approximately seven cameras and at least two cine cameras, plus a mixture of lenses and colour and black and white film. Most of this equipment, however, vanished in the ice, and he experimented with early colour techniques, flash photography, and broke convention by controversially creating photo montages like a painter. 
but most of these pitches were nearly lost when the endurance was crushed, and according to Hurley, it was only his determination that saved them for posterity. With endurance gradually sinking beneath the ice, Hurley reportedly removed all of his clothes and plunged naked into the icy waters to save his precious pitches before the ship disappeared beneath. While the surface temperature in Antarctica is routinely sub-zero in both Celsius and Fahrenheit, and the water is colder than that, considering his mother's concerns about his lung condition, it seems highly unlikely that Hurley actually pulled off this task the way he reported it. That being said, when instructions came to move from the wreck site to the coast, to Hurley's dismay, Shackleton insisted that the glass plate negatives that he had collected were too heavy to carry as the party had to deal with the issue of dragging their lifeboats and supplies and anything superfluous wasn't necessary. Hurley then faced the appalling choice, but apparently calmly sat down on the ice and painstakingly filtered the 600 plus plates, smashing over 500 he deemed unfit to avoid having any second chances. The remaining 150 plates thus acquired a priceless status. Hurley was among Shackleton's most reliable and versatile comrades as the party drifted on the ice flow at the mercy of the currents. He was an accomplished dog driver and hunter and used his old engineering skills to make a vital blubber stove from an old oil drum. The ever practical Hurley also ate the sledge dogs when the food ran out and explained, hunger brings us all to the level of other species. He lived for a year with the rest of the endurance crew, huddled beneath the two upturned boats on Elephant Island within the South Shetland Islands off the coast of Antarctica, as Shackleton sailed north to get help. Hurley took the picture of Shackleton departing the island on a tiny boat, the James Cad, on what became the most famous and daring voyages in maritime history. After Shackleton reached the South Georgia Islands and the manned whaling stations located there, he managed to arrange for a whaler called the Southern Sky to attempt to recover the rest of the expedition on the 22nd of May. After it was discovered that the Southern Sky wasn't capable of completing the rescue, Shackleton cabled London and requested a more suitable ship be sent. After three aborted attempts from three separate governments, the Chilean government was able to send the steam tug Yelko to Elephant Island in August 1916 to finally retrieve the stranded expedition. After being repatriated to Chile, Hurley travelled to London in late 1916, by which the First World War was at a critical stage for the Entente powers, but he did not immediately enlist. Instead, he assembled the film he brought back, comprising the footage from both Mawson's and Shackleton's expeditions, and photographs including colour plates, even going so far as to return to South Georgia Island in the South Atlantic to secure more footage of wildlife. He felt that this was needed to make the Shackleton film more commercial. This work occupied nine months until August 1917, during which time some of the other men he had known from the both Mawson and Shackleton expeditions, including Edward Beige, had died in French and Belgian battlefields. He would go on to release In the Grip of Polar Ice to varying degrees of success. The assemblies of these films were shown all over the world, sometimes with Hurley providing a live narration in the theatre. This film, along with Home of the Blizzard, also served to further his celebrity, and during the time of war, actually were significant enough to detract from reporting of the conflict. When Hurley finally joined the Australian Imperial Force, Australia had had no official photographers for the first years of the Great War. The only true photographic record from this time came from the soldiers themselves using smuggled cameras or from the official correspondent Charles Bean, who alone took more than 700 photographs during the Gallipoli campaign in 1915. But like all soldiers on the Western Front, Bean was forbidden to use his camera once the Australians moved to France in 1916. Bean faced disinterest from the British War Office when he complained. They told him that he was free to use British photographers on loan, but that was unsatisfactory to Bean's requirements. Bean's own diaries outline the increasingly cranky detail, the shortcomings of the British photographers that he was forced to use before the appointment of Australian photographers. Bean saw photographs as an important part of the historical record, but the British cameraman he was sent throughout 1916 was focused solely on selling these photos to British newspapers. They saw their task as providing pictures for propaganda and daily news value rather than history. When Hurley arrived in France on the 21st of August 1917, along with fellow polar photographer Hubert Wilkins, Charles Bean thought his prayers had been answered. Both men were self-taught photographers and both had been hardened by polar expeditions. Wilkins had spent three years in the Arctic with the ill-fated 1913 Canadian expedition led by Viljamor Stephenson, during which he'd become close to dying, and Hurley had courted death in the Antarctic with Shackleton. Both Hurley and Bean would hold the same honorary rank of captain, while Wilkins would hold the rank of lieutenant. 
What differed between the three men was that Bean had almost three years of continuous war experience behind him, and Wilkins had previously covered the 1912's Balkans War as a news cameraman. But as Hurley was the senior photographer, his focus was on the needs of daily propaganda and press, while Wilkins was to be the photographer of record, working more closely with Bean to document all of the Australian units in their battlefields. Not long after his arrival in France, Frank Hurley would travel to the recently taken region of Polygon Wood on the 27th of September 1917 and would come across a weary looking soldier in a German soldier's cap surrounded by artillery shells, links of machine gun ammunition, potato masher hand grenades, helmets, rifles, canteens, personal effects, and counting a wad of captured Franks and German marks. That soldier was, of course, John Barney Hines, and the photograph would go on to be called Wild Eyes, the souvenir king of the AIF going down as one of his most famous shots of the war. In my research on Hurley for this episode, coupled with what I already knew of John Hines for episode 2 of season 1, considering Hurley's push on for manipulating images to tell the story he wanted to tell, this has led me to question just how much of the loot around Barney Hines was actually his, and how much of it was placed there by Hurley to improve the impact of the image. If it was a fabricated photo, the look on Hines' face tells a completely different story. Despite this... Both Hurley and Wilkins soon became renowned for the risks they took, trying to get footage of exploding shells as they fell, they were nearly killed on several occasions, and became known to the troops as the Mad Photographers. In Hurley's diary from the 26th of September, he wrote, Yesterday we were damn near succeeded in having an end made about to ourselves. In despite of heavy shelling by the Bosch, we made an endeavour to secure a number of shell burst pitches. Many of the shells broke only a few score or paces away, so we had to throw ourselves into the shell holes to avoid splinters. I took two pitches by hiding in a dugout and then rushing out and snapping. One of these shells had hit a dump four of 4.5 inch shells and up went timber stones, shells and everything else in the vicinity. The frightful concussion absolutely winded us, but we escaped injury and we made off through mud and water as fast as we possibly could. Egad, I've never had such a row in my life. The partnership between Bean and Wilkins lasted throughout the end of the war until late 1918 and resulted in so much valuable work, both in still photography and moving images. The relationship between Bean and Hurley, however, floundered as soon as it started, mainly because Hurley kept repeatedly trying to take single images that encapsulated the, all the drama of warfare, but felt that the task was impossible. Instead, he turned to his trusted favourite, The Dark Room, to create composite images using parts from different negatives, as he'd done for his Antarctic work. These composite images were indeed striking, but Bean was appalled. This has always been an interesting point to me, because Hurley had been contracted to take propaganda material, while Wilkins was responsible for taking the historical record. And while there is a degree for uh, his accuracy in the subject, the whole point of propaganda is to generate a desired reaction something that historically, to a degree, vindicated Hurley in his posterity, because if the desired reaction isn't being gathered, it falls on Hurley to create it. Bean regarded all his photographs, however, as fakes and forbade Hurley from exhibiting them. From that point on, though, Hurley's photographs in France were controversial, influential, and graphic. And yet, even today, they continue to be reproduced by writers and historians for whenever they need images that typify the worst of the war. In a sense, his commercial instincts were the source of his success. They drove him harder and further in the pursuit of the perfect picture. His shipmates on the Aurora and later on the Endurance had marveled at the lengths he was prepared to go in pursuit of good images, and the soldiers in the trenches had started to see that same obsession. At the same time, though, those instincts have undermined the reputation of some of his work because he was prepared to lie if it made for a better picture. An example of this is the famous photo of Shackleton returning to Elephant Island after his epic voyage on the James Cad. Hurley took no such photo. He actually just took a negative shot of the day Shackleton and the six men of his expedition left, doctored it in the darkroom, and then recaptioned it as the arrival shot he sorely needed to satisfy the British press. Hurley may have projected himself as the boy's own adventurer, but his eye was always on the marketplace. The difficult apprenticeship in postcards in Sydney had cemented a strong commercial instinct, and he never lost that, even if his task wasn't strictly commercial. Hurley retaliated swiftly to Bean's criticisms by threatening to resign his commission, to the point where he took his case secretly to the British General in Command of Australian Forces General Sir William Birdwood. Birdwood negotiated a compromise, which allowed six composites to be included in an upcoming expedition of photographs depicting the Australian's experience in France and the Middle East, and Hurley retracted his resignation, but the rupture was final. 
He left in December for the Middle East in order to photograph Australian operations there for the same expedition without Bean's involvement. The result of this falling out is that The Fighting in Flanders, 1917, is the only film of Australia's work on the Western Front in which Hurley's contribution is significant. It was filmed through the Third Battle of Ypres during the Battle of Passchendaele, one of the bloodiest conflicts of the war throughout September of 1917. In this film, there's a big difference in the quality of the cinematography in comparison to the films shot by non-Australian photographers in 1916 and the early part of 1917. The scenes are more graphic and pictorial, much like the quality of work of Frank Hurley. He was the senior photographer in this period, and his diaries record a frenetic amount of work as the battle progressed. Hurley continued to improve the truth in his work in the Middle East, away from the strict supervision of Charles Bean. Early in 1918, he reenacted the charge of the 4th Australian Light Horse Brigade at Beersheba with two regiments of borrowed troops, which was potentially more than what actually took part in the real event in October 31, 1917. He borrowed 20 troopers to parade through the streets of the recently occupied Jerusalem, even though no Australian troops had taken part in its capture. His reasoning was that pictures of Jerusalem without Australian troops would not hold much military or public interest. He also took his first flight in an aeroplane, something that had profound effect on him. This episode is a perfect example of when to check the, this podcast social media feeds, because I'll be linking a lot of images and photographs taken by this man. The footage that he took with the Australian Flying Corps is a good example of Hurley's ingenuity and doggedness in the pursuit of the good shot. He actually fashioned a brace to attach the camera to the observer's cockpit using rubber pads to minimise vibration. The pilot of this flight would be the soon-to-be-famous Ross Smith, an Australian ace. In 1919, Ross and his brother Keith would actually become the first to fly an aircraft from Britain to Australia, and it would invite Hurley to accompany them when they reached Western Queensland and captured the early aerial shots of Sydney when he landed. While in Cairo, he met a young opera singer, Antoinette Rosalind Layton, daughter of an Indian army officer. She was 22, he was 32, and after a 10-day courtship, they married on the 11th of April 1918 at the Australian barracks in Cairo. Hurley would be wearing an Australian light horse uniform complete with emu feather in his hat, despite not being a part of the light horse. He soon left for England to prepare his pictures for the Australian War Exhibition, which would include the six controversial composites. Hurley was well represented in this historic expedition of photography and pictures by the official war artists, too well according to Bean, who saw it in June. His name is on every picture with few exceptions, including some that Wilkins took, and that should be a fine monument to the sacrifice of Australians in France rather than an advertisement for Hurley. Bean would fume in his diary. Bean was still smarting from another grievance. He had discovered that Hurley had actually tried to smuggle some color negatives out of France without submitting them to the military censor, which was a major breach of discipline. Hurley was determined that the London expedition should be seen in Australia, and Bean was just as determined that Hurley should have no involvement in its management. This was apparently the last straw in the feud between Hurley and Bean. In response, Hurley resigned, disgusted by the way in which he had been treated by the army, the Australian consular authorities, and Bean. I've washed my hands absolutely with the AIF and will not be identified with nor give any further efforts on their behalf, he wrote. While this is not entirely true, he retained the honorary title of Captain Hurley for the rest of his life and used it proudly. Cap came his new nickname. Despite this falling out and issues between Bean and Hurley, when the Australian War Museum and later Australian War Memorial were opened, they included a number of photographs taken by Frank Hurley, including quite prominently the souvenir king of the AIF, the shot he took of John Barney Hines. Hurley returned to Australia in early 1919 with his new wife heavily pregnant with what would be turned into twin girls. He was determined to continue with an adventurous life that would support his new family and extended his already considerable fame, preferably with a significant gain in wealth. He pursued a number of business opportunities, but he lacked the patience and attention to detail that might have made them a success. He was impulsive and prone to grandiose plans that were never fully developed. He quarreled with most of his partners in business, including Shackleton and Mawson, although he and Mawson continued to respect each other's talents. He continued exploring after the war, shooting documentary films in exotic and largely unexplored parts of the newly acquired Australian dominions of Papua and New Guinea, then turning to feature film production. Between December 1920 and January 1923, Hurley made two long and well-publicized filming expeditions to the Torres Strait Islands and to Papua and attracted further attention by shipping two small planes to Port Moresby and flying them along the coast. 
Again, the Papuan films, especially Pearls and Savages, released in December of 1921, were major commercial successes. He followed them up with a book of travellers' tales and photographs, also called Pearls and Savages, as he was to do on several other of his films. However, he clashed bitterly with Sir Herbert Murray and the Papuan administration over allegedly bad publicity that he was giving to the territory through his sensational stories of headhunters and unexplored jungle wilds and more seriously, of allegedly improper methods used to gather a large collection of artefacts for the Australian Museum in Sydney. In 1925, Hurley was refused entrance to Papua to make a fiction film for the Australian-born magnate of the British film industry, Sir Oswald Stoll. The film crew had to then relocate to the Dutch New Guinea. Jungle Woman was released in May of 1926, followed by Hound of the Deep, made for Stoll on Thursday Island. After spending 1927 as a pictorial editor for The Sun in Sydney, Hurley set off for an abortive attempt to fly from Australia to England. 1930s were no less busy for Hurley, but entailed a more settled life with his family in Valcluse. He worked with the CineSound studio as a cameraman for four feature films, but his meticulous style did not adapt well to the high pressure of expensive studio productions, and CineSound established him instead to be the head of their documentary unit to produce films for government and private sponsors. He was by then world famous, not just the most famous photographer in Australia, the most famous Australian photographer. When Mawson mounted his British, Australian and New Zealand Antarctic Recess or Banzar expedition in 1929 and 1931, Hurley went on as the official photographer. This produced another expedition film, Siege of the South, 1931, in which we hear Hurley's own voice, recorded as narration with the new sound on film technology. Hurley was an expert narrator at this time, having done hundreds of times during live performances of his earlier Antarctic films. This film finally broke the relationship between Mawson and Hurley, however, as Mawson blamed Hurley for the film's poor returns and for the way Hurley trivialized the expedition in a vain attempt to make it more palpable for children and school groups. Mawson never forgave him for introducing Mickey Mouse to what was supposed to have been a f serious film about the expedition's scientific achievements, and by 1940, Mawson was threatening him with legal action for breach of contract. The failure of the Siege of the South, 1931, coincided with the rise of the Great Depression and the collapse through plummeting box office numbers of the Australian Union Theatres, run by the wily showman Stuart Doyle. From the ashes of that company, however, Doyle refinanced and renamed the group Greater Union, a conglomerate with interest in film production, expedition, distribution, radio, and dance halls. Hurley would spend most of the 1930s working for that company in one venture or another. It was the one period in his life in which he had regular employment. It's also unusual that he spent most of his time at home with his family after long absences during the 20s. His first task for Greater Union was a series of shorts to be shown in support of major features, but Hurley had trouble curbing his photographic ambitions. For his film about the building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, Symphony of Steel, 1932, he shot approximately 18,000 feet of negative, of which only 1,000 feet was actually used. For Fire Guardians in 1932, the hilariously odd dramatization of firefighting techniques through the centuries, he reburned the Cumberland paper mills, a site of a previous spectacular fire. By mid 1932, Hurley joined Cinesound Productions, the production arm of Greater Union, at the suggestion of Stuart Doyle. The new studio was a major gamble for Doyle, but it paid off with their first film, On Our Selection, 1932, created by Ken G. Hall, one of the most important figures in the Australian film industry. Hurley joined as the director of cinematography on Hall's second feature, The Squatter's Daughter, 1933, a spectacular rural melodrama that also called for a fiery finale. The story of how Hurley and Hall used highly flammable nitrate film to set a fire in the bushland west of Sydney is part of the film industry's folklore, but it, but it yielded realistic results, though incredibly controversial in the current uh, time. Hurley's next film for Cinesound was The Silence of Dean Maitland, 1934, a much more studio-bound production in which Hurley demonstrated his command of studio lighting. Hurley continued as chief cameraman of the next four years and would work on Strike Me Lucky, 1934, featuring uh, comedian Roy Reen, Grandad Rudd, and with Burt Bailey in early 1935, Orphan of the Wilderness, 1936, and Parts of Thoroughbred, 1936, Lovers and Luggers, 1937, and Tall Timbers that same year. He was increasingly becoming sidelined after Hall visited Hollywood in late 1935. He came back determined to change the visual style of Cinesound's movies. He had become frustrated with Hurley's hard style in which large amounts of light were thrown at the subject in order to achieve maximum depth of field, producing great sharpness. 
That was a natural instinct for a photographer like Hurley, but the stars were changing. American movies were moving to a more luminous, soft focus look that required less lightning, and was more atmospheric and comfortable for actors, in consideration that never really bothered Frank Hurley. Hall began increasingly to use Hurley's former deputy, George Heath, a young cinematographer with a firm grasp of the new style. Hurley was put in charge of a new unit, producing sponsored documentaries. He was able to run his own show, which may have suited him more than working under a director. Still, it was still at relegation. By his own standards, he'd already come down in the world in having to take a paid job. Now he's been moved aside for younger men. He was past 50 at this point and in danger of becoming a forgotten man. Luckily, a new war would save his reputation. Kinda. Hurley was quick at this time to offer his services in his conflict during the 1939-45 conflict, and he wrote to his friend Sir Henry Gullett, of whom he had worked in Palestine in 1918. Gullett had written parts of the official history of Australia in the war 1914-1918, and now the Minister of External Affairs in the newly elected Conservative government of Robert Menzies. Hurley's offer was nothing if not ambitious. According to his biographer, Alistair McGregor, he offered to take over all photographic activities of the AIF at home and on active service. Gullett rebuffed him on three separate occasions, believing Hurley was too old to take an active role. As minister in charge of the Department of Information, through which all war propaganda was administered, Gullett appointed two relatively junior photographers, Damien Parra and an unknown 23-year-old New Zealander, George Silk. Both would distinguish themselves as war photographers, but Parra would sadly be killed in action in 1944. Frustrated, Hurley accepted an offer from the Australian Broadcasting Commission to act as a roving correspondent. He would be responsible for a small team sending back news broadcasts, articles, and photographs, but he only got as far as Perth, where he received a belated invitation from the government through the Department of Information to take control of all Australian photographic operations in the Middle East. Sir Henry Gullett had lost external affairs in a cabinet reshuffle and Menzies appointed Sir Keith Murdoch, father of media tycoon Rupert Murdoch, as his new Director General of Information. Murdoch was a fan of Hurley's work and remembered his daring in France in 1917. Ken Hall also supported the appointment of Hurley as a way of ensuring an industry presence in the production of newsreels from the war front. Hurley arrived in the Middle East in September 1940 as head of a small unit that included Para. Silk and a Department of Information producer and writer, Ron Maislin Williams, Alan Anderson, and a sound recorders from Cinesound. Much like the issues between Bean and Hurley in the Great War, there were difficulties from the start. The 28 year old Para, bursting with ambition, resented Hurley's desire to meddle. I find working with Hurley difficult, he wrote to friends at home. He's a good bloke in himself, but unfortunately, having worked so much of his own, on his own, he cannot tolerate any other man doing a responsible amount of work. He must be number one on top of all time. Surprisingly, Hurley was now more careful this time than he was in the Great War. Though remaining unquestionably courageous, Hurley's amassed years from life's catalogue of miraculous escapes had sobered his approach to danger. He was no longer the war photographer who coolly dodged shells in the wastelands of Ypres. Hurley and Anderson spent nearly a month with the Australian troops during the siege of Tobruk. Despite being surrounded by action, Hurley showed an inclination to restage or fake incidents for the camera, writes McGregor. He dramatized the crash of a Junkers fighter a day after it was shot down by spreading engine sump oil and lighting it, combining footage with two real raids. Anderson was disgusted by this fakery, as were the soldiers that Hurley enlisted to help him. Relations deteriorated between Hurley and most of his team to the point where Anderson even refused to speak to him, communicating all their demands through the driver Morrison. Both Anderson and Perra thought Hurley's desire to attain perfect images of the war was missing the point. He missed the opportunity in Tobruk to capture the drama of the actual situation, preparing instead to fake it. His approach had always been pictorial rather than news-orientated, and the younger men were there for news, not art. That pictorial instinct had driven him to recreate composites in 1917 and restage the charge at Hiroshima. Uh, camera was never a primarily a tool for reporting the news in Hurley. It was a fundamental point of difference between him and the younger men. The unit broke up in early 1942 when the 6th and 7th Divisions of the AIF were recalled to Australia. Perra and Silk went with them to cover the war in New Guinea. Hurley stayed behind with the 9th Division in Africa, making short films that he sent back to an increasingly cool reception at the Department of Information. Some of his footage of the Battle of El Alamein ended up in the British film Desert Victory, but the department had become impatient. The main reasoning for this was that Hurley had been ordered to create newsreel footage 
rather than documentary films that he was sending back to Australia to meet the increasingly urgent public demand for current news. In November 1942, Ken Hall was asked to review Hurley's output in a report for the Department of Information. Having helped Hurley get the job, it now fell to Hall to help him undo it. Most of the material arriving from the Middle East was neither spectacular nor did it have any news or story value. Hall would write, Captain Hurley is apparently still laboring under the belief that his stuff has been turned into two real featurettes, which, as you know, has never been the case. Such material would not be suitable for theatres. Newsreel editors are not looking for artistic camera effects, but are still looking for news material with definite propaganda value. At this time, however, he would, Hurley would be awarded the Polar Medal and two bars for his operations with Morrison and Shackleton, and was appointed to the Order of the British Empire for his services in both polar exploration and photography, which would have done nothing to soothe his ego. By the end of 1942, the department had decided to bring Hurley home, without bothering to inform him of the criticisms of his work. However, Hurley must have known something was up, because he jumped ship. He had good contacts with his British colleagues in the British Army, and they offered him a job in the Middle East area as Director of Army Features and Propaganda Films with the British Ministry of Information on a salary of Lieutenant Colonel, which he leapt at. Hurley wasn't the only one to fall out with the Australian Department of Information. Damien Parra and George Silk also left in displeasure at the department's niggling and penny-pinching ways. Parra went on to work for Paramount News United States, while Silk distinguished himself in Europe as a photographer for Life magazine. Hurley spent the next three and a half years making documentaries for the British, concentrating as much on the cultures of the Middle East as on the war. This work must have satisfied him to some deep level because he stayed in the Middle East until the middle of 1946, nine months after the war had ended. He had more resources at his disposal and far greater success. During this time, he actually met and filmed Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt and Joseph Stalin, and most of the leaders of the Arab world. He had developed a strong attachment to the Middle East after his first short sojourn there in 1917, and this second trip only cemented that. By the time he returned to Sydney in 1946, he had been away for six years. He had already missed a great deal of his family's life, including the marriages of his children and the births of his grandchildren. His daughter Adlai became the first woman press photographer in Australia. Hurley's wife, Antoinette, who had not seen much of her husband through most of the children's upbringing, had fashioned a void of sadness and disillusionment in her life. Most of the money Hurley had made during the war was gone. He was 60 and broke. Hurley reacted to this new situation in his customary energy. He threw himself into the production of photographic books rather than moving images. He decided to show Australia to Australians. In effect, he was returning to the postcard business almost 50 years after he started in photography. This method of publishing had changed, but not his approach. He would spend hours sitting atop a freezing mountain waiting for the right light for that one great shot that he'd pre-visualized. His books were soon selling very well. In the spirit of optimism of post-war Australia, Hurley's optimistic, conservative brand of photography, based on idyllic views of nature, suited the needs of his audience. As ever, Hurley remained a commercial photographer, with a high standard of technical excellence. He was largely unaffected by the new trends in photography. He continued to shoot using old-fashioned full-plate cameras, confident that they provided the best quality. Some of these books that he created were bestsellers and the family's finances improved. He was actually able to buy a house in Collaroy Plateau, a beachside suburb of Sydney, and the first home he had ever owned. The house had an acre of garden, which would occupy much of his spare time. He became a frequent guest as a storyteller on the ABC Radio children's segment The Argonauts Club, 1941-72, and by 1956 the publisher John Sands was selling 200,000 Frank Hurley calendars each year. He crisscrossed Australia many times on his extended photographic field trips. The last of these was in September 1961, when he crossed the Nullarbor Plain from Perth, stopping at Ucla to investigate particular limestone caves. At the age of 75, he descended a 300-foot rope ladder to shoot inside the caves and was struck by pain in the chest as he prepared to climb out. It appears that he suffered a heart attack, first of many, but he told no one. In January 1962, after a day's work, he sat in his favourite armchair overlooking the garden and refused to move. He died early on the next day, on the 16th of January, age 76, of a myocardial infarction. He was cremated and survived by his wife, son, three daughters, their families. A few days before his death, he had actually completed filming of a segment for a documentary called Antarctic Pioneers 1962, using footage that he'd shot 40 years earlier with Douglas Mawson.
When it comes to Hurley, well, what is his legacy? His Antarctic photography is perhaps his greatest body of work and some of his, the most important from the heroic age of polar expedition. His photography from the First World War, although controversial, is still brilliantly invocative and graphic, taking us closer to the horrors of the Western Front than any of his contemporaries. Some of his moving images from his period are also remarkably powerful. His films from the 1920s in Papua are compromised by the buccaneering ways in which they were obtained, but they contain valuable ethnographic records. His work in Cinesound in the 1930s remains impressive. His sense of daring and his insistence on technical excellence helped make the early Cinesound films spectacular and popular. His work as a cameraman in the Second World War is perhaps less noteworthy, but that's open to debate. He was by then an older man. Disillusioned by the excitement of war, it was much harder to convince him to go to the front to capture the action when it was safer to recreate it behind the lines. But it's hard to blame him for not wanting to die for the sake of a shot. It, that has what happened to Damien Perrot in 1944. Hurley never claimed to be a news photographer. He was a pictorialist, concerned with the beauty of each image, both as a work of art and the craft as a, and as a commercial item. Those same instincts, what made his work memorable and saleable in the short term, tended to damage his reputation in the long term. During and doing anything for a shot meant he was prepared to assist reality to make the image better in a time well before Photoshop. He was hardly alone in that practice, but the controversy about composites and fakery has certainly damaged his reputation, and he worked hard to establish. Even if those criticisms are justified, they do not negate a lifetime's work, especially in the modern era when everyone is airbrushing and photo touching up their own images. Hurley led a remarkable life, the kind of boy's own adventure he dreamed of as a youngster. He took enormous risks and was lucky to survive. He became one of the greatest photographers of his time, if that time is the second decade of the 20th century. The best of that work is timeless, powerful, and remarkably beautiful. He kept diaries throughout his life, but he was a notoriously unreliable witness. He wrote himself in a breathless ma manner, as if starring in a boy's own adventure book. Unlike most of the people I've already featured on this podcast, Hurley left school at 13 and lacked any formal schooling of the other men of the time, but his diaries are written in a particular style in which he portrays himself as the hero. Considering the era in which he grew up, where boys of his generation all over the British Empire were raised by these kinds of adventure narratives with lofty set of ideals, fair play, stoicism, courage, loyalty, Hurley took these tales as a kind of template for his own life, and he succeeded to a large extent of becoming not just a great photographer, but a great adventurer. It was this prodigious act of self-creation for a boy from fairly modest origins, and once established, he had, that reputation had to be defended and extended. Today, most Australians learn about Frank Hurley only in passing, when they learn about the First World War and the mention of composite photographs he took. However, in the photographic community, he's still well regarded, with the Frank Hurley Photographic Award, which has a prize pool of over $30,000. Even now, 100 years since he de debuted on the photographic scene, he is not just a famous photographer in Australia, he's still the most famous Australian photographer. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Ross Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it, and it would help out the show, if you took some time to share this with a friend, or leave a review on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode, with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at Doc Winters. Once again, thanks for listening, and catch you next time. Bye!